Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip is part one of a two-part interview we did with John Sebastian. John talks about how he became a, a musician living in the village in New York, uh, how he landed on playing an auto harp, and how the Love and Spoonful was formed, and how he ended up being quite accidentally on the Woodstock stage in 1969. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, John Sebastian. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, songwriter of Hall of Fame inductee, John Sebastian. John, thank you for doing this. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be able to do it. And uh, I remember having my little transistor radio. My dad got me in the fifth, sixth grade, something like, and here in summer in the city, when I should have been listening to math. Uh -huh. and, and oh, yeah. It was a great song. Yeah, that was the wonderful thing about transistor radios is they had the little earpiece that you could listen to after lights out. Right, or during class, and that's what I did, well, unfortunately. That's, that's, why I, that's why I can't count. A little naughtier <laughs> than I <laughs> So, you know, we have a lot of musicians that watch this as well as people who are just fans, you know. That, and, and so the musicians always want to know, you know, how did you get started and about your equipment and so forth. And so... How did you get started? Were you from a musical family? I was. Uh, my father was a marvelous chromatic harmonica player, classical. Had guys like Vila Lobos writing for him and Cherubnin and stuff like that. So I kind of grew up with a, a piano tuner <laughs> as another member of the family. Uh, and I uh, also, my mother was in radio and uh, she wrote funny for radio mm -hmm. but she also sang really good and very often some vocalist would not show up she knew all the lyrics you know so she would very often sub for whoever hadn't made it to the studio that's handy to have somebody like that yes it is so did you take proper you know lessons or did you learn by ear or? no i did not take proper lessons so you, you're self-taught? I am, sort of. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I had a couple of uh, terrific uh, young women that taught me a, a lot more than I knew about stuff like Carter picking and the auto harp and, and things like that. Uh, so I was still taking in a, a lot uh, as, as I was growing up. I pretty much was mostly interested in learning how to play That'll Be the Day. Uh, so I didn't really come at it from a fully folk background, really, right. but, uh, but it was certainly a, a, a wonderful environment that I grew up in because I'm born in Greenwich Village and lived there uh, pretty much until I got out of college. Um. I used to love going there to Matt Umanoff's guitar shop. Matt Wonderful Austin. place. Yeah. And was it John's Pizza right across from it? Uh, that was the good pizza place. No yes, yeah. that's right. Man. So, auto harp, I mean, that's kind of like, you're the only guy I know that plays auto harp and, and did it in a big way. I mean, how, how did that happen? You know, it just happened because I saw a couple of instruments Matter of fact, you're, you're bringing up a memory that uh, is, is somewhat uh, maybe key to it. Uh, my father and I had a great relationship. And there was uh, one particular evening when the family went out to a local uh, nice uh, commie folk singer friends, <laughs> you know, and we sat around and played a little bit of, little bit of music, or I was mostly watching. And there was an auto harp, which I then took into the other room and strummed it. And I, I know what this is. I, fe I felt like, oh, I get this. 
you know, I know I, I, what I was re reacting to was one four five. Right. I didn't know it at that time, but right. I was going, oh yeah, this is the second chord to that song. Yeah. So I was fascinated. And on the walk home, because we were all in the villagers and you walk. So on the walk home, I said, Dad, uh, that was really an interesting instrument. Uh, do you think that, uh, that we could uh, work out something where I earned uh, the money and, and, and bought an auto harp? He said, son, I'd never buy you that instrument. I'd never. I never had my father be that adversarial about something about like this. I said, what do you mean? He said, son, you'll never learn anything from this instrument. It's all prefabricated for you here. So you won't take in what you'd take in learning an instrument that had a, more of a chromatic uh, approach. Well, of course, that just made me want the instrument more. And it was several years before I actually did. You know, I was going to summer camp by the time I was 16, and uh, there was a lot of folk music going on yeah. in those camps. And I had a great five years where, in fact, the owner of the camp, uh, uh, after about two weeks, said, you're not going up to the riding rink anymore. You're just going up there because all the girls are up there. So here's what you do. You take over this little sugar house and conduct classes about five or six a day. Teach them a little theater, teach them a little song, that kind of thing. And that really set me on a path because the other thing that was in that little theater was a record player mm -hmm. and a great collection of mostly folk music. Mm -hmm. But your dad was right though. I mean if you if you just bash the button you'd never learn the chords. That's and, right. You know. But there's an addendum to this story because the spoonful get going I spend a little time in the in a basement with that instrument plugged in with a ukulele contact mic mashed onto the back of it with tape and so on. Right. And, uh, we make the record. I get a call from Dad. John, is that an auto harp I hear <laughs> in that that record mm. that's you know having such success? I said, yes, Dad, it is. He goes, it's for my sins. <laughs> well, I still think he was steering you in the right direction. Anyway. It was a good piece of advice. Yeah. It really yeah. was. So the jug band thing was happening. Yeah. And unbelievably, one of my all-time favorite groups came, well, two of them, you're the spoonful but the mamas and the papas well they didn't have much to do with jug band music but but uh, th th they were in that band though right with, with you and then they they uh, denny and, and mama Cass. Right? well uh the i think the sequence uh you're thinking of is that the mugwumps yeah were kind of a predecessor to all of this um included uh, zal and denny uh with Cass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other members kind of kind of filled in, uh, and then there was a moment when uh, Cass called me up and said, "You know, uh, you, you got any reason to come to Washington D.C.?" And I said, "I don't know." She said, "Cause we're we're doing beautifully here uh, at this club, and we're playing it and." Uh, well, we're actually doing uh, one of the first tunes I wrote, Good Time Music. And uh, so why, well, we wondering if you'd come and uh, bring us a kilo of pot. <laughs> I did that. And uh, uh, so I was a member for about two weeks, N not really officially, just having fun, until the uh, manager of the group fired me. 
uh, because I was a bad influence on Zalyanovsky, oh. which I was. And uh, because we'd play little things to each other and, and deviate from the arrangement written by the arranger. Right. And so, you know, this was a, a f this was a group that was a dinosaur. It, you know, it was the end of groups that just got arrangements from him and songs from them and we'll hire these guys to play. You know, that was really ending. Yeah. So once that group ended, I remember me and Yanofsky walking around going, what's going to happen? Cass is going to land on her feet. We know that. But what's going to happen to Denny? Of course, <laughs> it wasn't very many weeks later, maybe uh, maybe a couple of months, that uh, that whole sequence of the Phillipses going down the, I the islands mm -hmm. and Cass trying to get in the group and all of that stuff. So uh, uh, really, the jug band element was much more the result of being fans of Jim Queskin's jug band and people like Peter Stamfeld and Steve Weber, uh, the Holy Motor Rounders. Mm -hmm. And the, the particular kind of offbeat Little, I, I use the term psychedelic uh, 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 with caution because the Spoonful were never a psychedelic band. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a pot band. Uh, <laughs> so that just was, that was the way that was. That club in Washington, <clears throat> Emmy Lou was doing this interview with us and he was, she was telling me about a club in Washington that was folk like. I wonder if that's. Was there one particular club? There were two. Uh, there was uh, the um, cellar door and the shadows. Those were the two uh, real, the folkier venues. They were the right size, and yeah. good for a she one She said everybody guy, went there. One you know, guitar It was a great springboard. Kind of I, I, I'll bet that would be the case. Yeah, for I think she'd gone there originally with Graham Parsons, I believe. Yeah, yeah, might have been that'd be logical. But so much great music, though, morphed out of that folk. But, you know, that was... It really was. And, and Chicago was uh, another uh, factor there. People like Bob Gibson that not that many people know about now, but who had a particular kind of a style that was swinging. It was really the beginning of applying a little bit of a swing mm -hmm. to folk music. Well, electric folk, I mean, that was probably still in my, my, which I would say would be the Mamas and the Papas and the Birds and so forth, and Dylan. And of course, in, in, by the way, how, how, could, how did you turn down a gig with Dylan? Didn't, didn't he want you to be in the electric band? Well, it was sort of the dawn of that time period and uh, I'd already spent a week or two up in Woodstock with him and Albert Grossman at their house, the right. house that they were sort of sharing at that time and uh, we, uh, Bob and I had already had a little bit of a past in, in Greenwich Village because mm -hmm. we'd both end up at Gertie's Folk City uh, to hear Victoria Spivy or something like that, you know. So we were already, uh, you know, friendly. And you got to remember, this is the this is the pre "Don't Look Back" Bob Dylan. Right. This is a happy-go-lucky guy with a kind of Chaplin-esque quality to him, and so on. Yeah. And but he did have the uh, wonderful sarcasm and wit to him, and so he, he was a, a lot of fun to 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 be around. So I was very glad when he invited me up to Woodstock. And uh, during that period, I learned a lot because Bob was in the bedroom above me and I would be going to bed and I would hear the clacking of that typewriter mm -hmm. and know that it was going to go for another couple hours. And that was when I first realized, wow, this is what songwriting really is. It isn't oh, I got a little idea that flew in like a butterfly, you know. <laughs> well, that, you know, that's kind of the same experience that, um, that 
uh, Glenn Fry said he had with when he was living in the same house below um, Jackson, Brown. Jackson Brown. And he said that that's how he learned how to write was hearing him going over and over and over, you know, all the time. It didn't just happen yeah, that quickly, yeah. you know. So. so, yeah. So I returned from Woodstock and I uh, was back in New York and me and Zolly start hanging out together and we turn up Steve Boone in another band and now we're starting to get excited and we actually uh, go out to Long Island to rehearse. And uh, it was at a hotel that was closed for the winter so we could use this sort of central room that was big enough to play music in. And, i uh, been doing that for several days and the uh, phone rings and this is like, this is like a phone booth phone, right? Hey, hi, John, it's, it's Bob. So I was just thinking, I, I don't know, you might want to, I don't know, you, you probably would, I don't know if you want to do this, but I, I'm kind of thinking about, uh, I don't know, we might go on the road or something. And, you know, it's, it's, it's this completely vague presentation, which is classic Dylan. So I listen to his invitation and I say, Bob, I, I'm so sorry that I have to explain that, you know, during this time, I kind of got going with these guys and we kind of wrote a few things and I don't know, we, I kind of got to stick with it. Okay, you know, that was, that was the end of that. So. So yeah, I never heard from Bob again. <laughs> well, but it worked out, you know. It did work yeah. out. It did work out. Yeah, I'm lucky that way. Well, I've I've heard this before, you know, and it's a great story. Would you tell the um, how you did end up at the concert 1969 at Woodstock? Well, what happened was I'd been told about the festival by Paul Rothschild. He said, you know, nobody really gets this yet, but this is gonna be a big thing. So, man, you ought to try to get there. Well, it was pretty late to be trying to go find tickets or any of that stuff. I decided I'm gonna just go to the nearest airport and see if I can talk my way over to uh, White Lake. Well, I go to the Albany Airport. I'm looking out the big picture window in, in those days, which you could just look out, and there is a helicopter. And there's a guy loading musical instruments onto the helicopter. I look closer and I realize, imagine the coincidence, it's the roll, it's the Love and Spoonful's first road manager Schlepper, which is what we used to call it in, in New York. And uh, I, I wave, and of course, it's a window, so he can go, yeah, hi, hey, come here. There's the stairs, and so I go around <laughs> to the stairs, walk out on the tarmac. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Woodstocks would never <laughs> happen again. Uh, and I, I start talking to uh, m my old pal, and he says, you're trying to get to Woodstock. I said, that's right. He goes, you better get in this helicopter because there's no other way to get there. The roads are closed. There's n no transportation. Good. And I did it. And I, I, I got the same introduction to Woodstock that the whole world got in the movie where you're flying over this area where there's, you can't see any grass. It's all blankets and tents and, and uh, RVs and all of that stuff. So uh, I, it was very simple. I was landed. Uh, my pal was unloading, it was all for the Incredible String Band. So I kind of helped put their stuff in a tent that was nearby. And, that was m part of my first day. I, I wandered around the whole site with David Brown, the wonderful bass player from Santana, and uh, such a sweet man. And 
uh, we had this wonderful experience of just seeing it all. It took the whole day to do it. Uh, but then by the second day, come about midday, remember I'm walking pretty freely from the audience area to the backstage area because there really wasn't security. Mm. Uh, people didn't have that attitude about this music yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was quite free. And I ended up on the stage on Saturday sometime when it was uh, sort of pissing rain a little bit, but not a lot. And uh, I'm standing there and I got uh, Michael on one side and uh, Chipmunk on the other. and. Uh, I hear, I, I think it was Chip saying, we need somebody who can hold them with an acoustic guitar because we can't put an amplifier on this stage. It's too wet. And I'm uh, between the two guys. I'm looking out at the crowd and I'm going, yep, that's exactly what, what you guys need. Hey, let me take a break right here and we'll be right back.